Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll begin our Bible study together. Would you pray with me, please? Okay. Heavenly Father, we're very grateful for this new Sunday morning. We're thankful, Father, for this being the Lord's day that we can come together and worship and serve you. We are thankful, Father, for the Bible and for the information it contains to lead us to heaven. We pray, Father, that you help us to follow it within our lives and, and to be obedient to it each and every day. Father, we ask a special blessing upon those who are grieving the loss of loved ones and those who are uh, sick, sick at this time and dealing with infirmities of various sorts. We pray, Father, you bless them and keep them in your special care and help them in every way possible. Father, we're very thankful for the church. We ask your blessings on the church here in New Boston. And we pray, Father, that you help us to grow in love with one another and also to take your gospel to those around us in this community. Father, we have a gospel meeting coming up, and we pray for the success of that event. And we ask, Father, that it would be well attended and that, that there would be those who would respond to the message. And we pray that you bless uh, the, the one who's going to speak in that meeting and, and help him to make good preparations for it and help us also to uh, do what we can to prepare for it. And Father, we are grateful for our country that we live in, for the freedoms that we have. We pray that you help us never take those for granted, but to remember that you have given us these freedoms so that we can glorify you. And we pray that you help us to do that within our lives each and every day. Please, Father, forgive us of our sins. We're thankful for your son Jesus who died on the cross for us. And, and we pray that you help us to uh, be grateful for him each and every day. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this morning, Hebrews chapter 6, we're going to continue talking about uh, these verses. We got into verses 4, 5, and 6 last week, and we're thinking about this idea of the impossibility of apostasy that some have suggested. This is not a new doctrine. The doctrine of the impossibility of apostasy, or once they always say, has been around since <clears throat> the second century A.D. Now it is uh, attached today to Calvinism, and Calvinism is the teaching of John Calvin. It can be summed up with the uh, five-letter acronym TULIP. T-U-L-I-P. Total hereditary depravity is the idea that a person is born a sinner and there's nothing that can be done about that. Total hereditary depravity. Unconditional election. That is the doctrine that God chooses who is going to be saved and who is going to be lost. And there's nothing that the individual may do about that. Limited atonement. That's the doctrine that Jesus died on the cross only for the saved. And that he did not die for those who are lost. And so there is no, he didn't shed his blood for everyone, just for the saved, and that's it. Limited atonement. Um, irresistible grace is the notion that if you are saved, then God is going to imbue within your life such grace that you cannot resist it, and you are going to live the Christian life. So irresistible grace. And again, it's no choice on your part as to whether to live righteously or live unrighteously. It's God making you live that way. And then finally is perseverance of the saints. Okay, and that's the last one. And that's the one that's once saved, always saved. Okay, perseverance of the saints. And that means if a person is a Christian, you can remain a Christian. There's no way he cannot be uh, lost. And, um, and he's going to be saved regardless of what he does within his life. Now, if you can show 
And so all of these things follow from one another. From total heredity to primary, and then follows that. There must be an unconditional election because if a person is so depraved, he cannot uh, have, the, he does not have the ability to choose to do what is good. He can only choose what is evil, and so God must choose what is good for him. We must elect him. So an unconditional election follows from total hereditary depravity, and then limited atonement follows from the unconditional election doctrine, and then uh, from limited atonement follows the irresistible grace, and then from the irresistible grace doctrine follows the doctrine of perseverance of the saints. Okay, so they're all connected together. The one implies the other as they go forward. They're like a set of dominoes. Okay, if uh, you set one up, then you've got to set the other one up, and then the other one, and then the other one, and the other one. But the same the thing is true that if you knock one of them down, then the others necessarily follow as well. So if you knock down the concept of once saved, always saved, the first appearance of the saints, if that is false, then all of those doctrines are false. The whole system is false, and it must be rejected. And that's why this passage, among others, is so important and key in understanding God's truth. Because here in Hebrews chapter 6, in verses 4 through 6, it is explicitly stated that some who were once Christians fell away from the faith. And it wasn't like, you know, like some explain, I've talked to uh, several Baptist preachers in, in this regard who explain, well, if a person, you know, uh, makes the overtures that he or she is a, a Christian, you know, they say they believe, they say they repent, they, they are baptized and all these things, they look like, then they fall away. The answer is, well, they never were a Christian to begin with. Okay. They never really were saved to begin with, is what they will say. Again, this passage right here contradicts that teaching. Because look what it says. It says, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and who have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Now look at those five things that they have been involved in. The Bible says there are those who were involved in these things and then fell away. Verse 6. To renew them again to repentance. So there were those who had the enlightenment of God. They tasted of the heavenly gift. And the heavenly gift here uh, seems to be the uh, indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Maybe even the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit. They have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. And that's fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Tasted the good word of God. The powers of the age to come. Again, referring to uh, the miraculous in this context. So, so these are all the marks of what it means to be a faithful child of God. If you have these things, you are a Christian, you are a faithful Christian, and uh, these are all things that um, were given only to those who were saved. There's no doubt about it. And then he says, and then fell away. Those who had this, and then fell away. They are who is under discussion here. Okay? They fell away. They had all these things and then fell away. It wasn't the case that they just didn't really believe to begin with. Oh, yes, they did believe to begin with. It wasn't the case that they weren't saved to begin with. They were saved to begin with. What happened? They changed their mind. They left the 
truth. They went back. They decided they didn't want to be a Christian anymore. They made a choice. And in making that choice then, they fell away. Verse 6 says, Yes. That's right, in their unbelieving state. And so, that's the same thing that's happening here, except these are Christians who have been fallen away. So, the explicit statement of the Bible is that they fell away, and then fell away. We talked last week a little bit about verse 6, the word if. The word if was inserted in a, uh, a, a, I don't know what's the word here I'm looking for, a deceptive way by the translators of the King James Version of the Bible. It was preserved by the translators of the New King James Version of the Bible. It is not in the text. It is, it is not there. This was an effort. The King James translators, many of them were Calvinists. They, would, they held to the Westminster Confession of Faith, which was strictly a Calvinist doctrine, uh, document. And because of that, they could not translate the verse as it was in the Greek language. So they put the word if in there. To cast doubt upon the idea that a person could be a Christian and then fall away. It was a deliberate, uh, sinful <coughs> action on their part to add to the Word of God. And that word, if, is not in the Greek New Testament. It is not in the Bible that God created. Yes, sir? What is the Isaac Greek translation? It is uh, and then fell away. And then fell away is the, is the translation there. So, they, it is impossible for those who are once in life to taste the heavenly gift, become partakers of the Holy Spirit, taste the good word of God, powers of the age to come, and then fell away. Yes. How do they justify the need for keeping a man dying on the cross? I would have to go back and study my Calvinism a little deeper. Um, that is one of the problems, I believe, with Calvinism is that it doesn't seem to be a, there doesn't seem to be a reason that Jesus would need to die on the cross. But, like I said, they already limited it to just the saved. He only died for the saved. Um, and my only, I guess, I guess they would say something like, well, the, the penalty for sin still needed to be paid. Or something like that. Um, is what they would probably say. Something to that effect. But, it doesn't seem like uh, there would be a need since if God specifically chose people for salvation, it's just arbitrarily His will who is saved and who is lost. It doesn't, there doesn't seem to be a need for Jesus to die on the cross, does it? Um, in, in that system of belief, uh, it seems to make the death of Jesus on the cross irrelevant. And, and John Calvin ultimately would say it's all, it all goes back to the will of God. That God can will anything that He desires. Um, is that true? Can God will anything He desires? Can God will, for example, murder to be right? Could He? And I'm not talking about killing. I'm talking about murder. Unjustified killing. Could God will that to be right? Could He will uh, 
something like a rape to be a good thing. You know, could he will something like, um, um, let's say for example, uh, adultery to be a good thing? Could he will that? And the answer is no. Uh, God can't will that which is sinful, inherently sinful, to be good. He can't just say, okay, this is now going to be a good thing instead of a sinful thing. Because it, in his character, in his moral character, uh, God's moral character is such that it cannot be contradicted by himself. God is a holy moral being. God is love. And the implication of that is that there is a core part of God's being that is moral in nature. And because it is moral in nature, God can't will something that is going to contradict the uh, morality of his own being. That is just not, it just can't happen. It's a, it would be a logical contradiction in God to do that. So, beyond uh, the need for the Christ to sanctify us, uh, we also have the purpose of the book that we can contradict it here. The entire epistle is being written to Hebrews and Christians so that they would not fall away. If it is impossible to fall away, it follows that this is one. Yes, yes. And, and some have pointed out. about Calvinism that are not consistent with what people are preaching 
in the nominations to hey, there's a lot of things. Calvin didn't believe in, in uh, personal freedom. He believed that God determined everything. So there are churches that practice the pure, unorthodox view of Calvinism today? The primitive Baptists are the closest, yes. The primitive they, Baptists. I also heard they baptize for remission of sin as well. I, I don't know about that. But um, I know some of them, and, and it's not going to be consistent, okay? You're not going to find a consistent practice of Calvinism across the board denominationally. You're not, you're not going to go out there and find that, all right? What I'm trying to say this morning is that the most popular tenet of Calvinism, Calvinism which is the doctrine of one saved, all one saved, that's the most popular tenet of it, right. is false. If that's false, the whole system is false, okay? <coughs> now, they may uh, disagree with another part of that system somewhere and still hold to once saved, always saved. Alright? Um, but what I'm saying is if once saved, always saved is false, you can't accept any of Calvinism. So you've got to reject all of it. And that's the problem is that they want to pick and choose. Well, I, I, don't, I don't like this particular part of Calvinism, but I like this part. And so I'm going to take this part, but I'm not going to take that part. You can't do that with Calvinism. You've got to either take all of it or none of it. And, and that's, that's the issue that needs to be uh, discussed with people who believe in Calvinism. All right? So, anyway. Yes, Brother, Brother Weaver. There is one argument that used to be used in verses of the Lord of God. I've heard it all the time. I've heard it here for a full month. If you're a cut, the church supposedly teaches Say one minute, all say all, all the day. All say all say all say. Therefore, you don't have any security with me. So I don't teach that at all. Teaching Christians do have a uh, safe and security in the heart, even though you may sin your own way. That doesn't mean you're lost. And say all say your own way. But as I said, that argument used to be used, and I've already heard it stand here in the years past. a long time. Okay. That's a good point and a good question. If once saved, always saved is not true, then is it the case that when you sin, you're lost immediately? And then when uh, you, you know, make, make amends for that, you're saved again, and that as many times as you sin during the day, you're lost, you're saved, you're lost, you're saved, you're lost, you're saved. Is that true? And the answer is no, that's not true. Okay? That's not true. That would imply that the Christian has no security in salvation at all. Here's the, thing, here's the difference between that. Those that the writer of the book of Hebrews is talking about right here in chapter 6 are those who have rejected Christ. They have left Christ completely and gone back to Judaism. Okay? Now that's different than being a Christian and saying, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and following Him and doing your best to following Him and then in a moment of weakness committing some sin. Maybe you lie about something that you shouldn't lie about. Or maybe you uh, express a less than loving attitude toward your your wife or your husband or your children or something like that. That's a sin, you know. Bible says, love your wife, love your love your husband, love your children. Do we always do that? I I'm ashamed to confess I fail. All right, I fail in doing that consistently, um, and I need help with that. But does that mean that now I'm lost all of a sudden? No, it doesn't mean that. What does it mean? It means that I need to grow more. And I need to have I rejected Christ completely because in a moment of weakness I found myself uh, hating my brother? No. What does it mean? It means I need to repent and grow and, and do better. And I will recognize that within my mind and I will make correction on that, you know. Um, that is something that is ongoing because we are afflicted with this world, which is imperfect, and all the things.
things that are in it, and we need help. And so we've got to work on it every single day. The promise that we have of our uh, security and salvation is in 1 John 1 and verse 7. If we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Christ continues to cleanse us or cleanses us from all sin. So if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Wait a minute. If we walk in the light, what? It cleanses us from sin as we're walking in the light. Some who teach this say, if you're walking in the light, you don't sin. Well, how can we be cleansed from sin if we're walking in the light? If, if there's no sin, nothing that needs to be cleansed, if you're walking in the light, then we couldn't be cleansed from sin while we're walking in the light. You see what I'm saying? But it says we are cleansed of sin while we're walking in the light. What does that mean? It must mean then that as we're walking in the light, that sometimes we stumble. You know, I can, I can walk down this aisle and, and trip. And the lights are bright and light on. And I'm walking down the aisle and all of a sudden I, I trip and stumble. Well, you know, what would I need to do? I would need to get up and keep going. And that's what you do when you're walking in the light. You trip and stumble. You, you get up and you keep going. But I'm not walking in darkness. I haven't stumbled there because I'm walking in darkness. I've stumbled because I'm imperfect. I'm weak. There's a pro problem with me somehow. And that has caused me to, to trip and stumble. Not because I wasn't in the light. But if I was in the darkness and tripped and stumbled, then you would say, well, you were just foolish. <laughs> right? If you walk in the dark, you should expect to trip and stumble. That's what's going to happen. Because you're walking in the dark. So, and that's the difference between what the writer in the book of Hebrews is talking about. Those people have stopped walking in the light and they have gone back to darkness. Whereas these here in verse John 1 verse 7 are walking in the light. They're forgiven. But if you go back to walking in darkness, you're not forgiven. You can't turn your back on Jesus Christ and expect to be saved. You just can't do that. That's not going to happen. And that's what the writer of the book of Hebrews is telling us here. They had all these benefits, and then they fell away. Now, sometimes, uh, but, but is there any more questions or comments about that before I change into another thought here? Um, the presence of that word in verse John 1, verse 7. It, it is a very good text. Yes. And it says so the whole case of one right here, all, all the way through. It's that pretty good jam all the way. If we walk by well, the possibility we may not do. We have to try to have that much work with that. And continually uh, put forward effort to make that happen. That's, that's right. And as long as I'm doing that, as long as I'm walking in light, as long as I'm choosing Jesus Christ and obeying Him to the best of my ability, I'm forgiven. And God is going to forgive me. And that's my sins that I commit while I'm walking in the light is not going to affect my salvation. That's called grace. Okay, that's called God's grace, God's favor on His people. Yes, the, uh, you, you hit it right there, Dan. I was going to say grace, just like a grace period of you know a day or two on your tag or or anything we use the word grace period for. God's grace gives you that ability, that time frame to fall and stand up, ask for forgiveness, and keep walking. Versus if there was no grace, it would be just like Brother Will said. Uh, we were said, as soon as you fell. A lot of, you know, he wouldn't care. God wouldn't care. But His grace gives you, the gives you the opportunity to stand up because He does. There's another passage, Romans.
Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, um, Paul asks this question, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now that's a question. But there's an implication of that question. And the implication is that grace abounds even when we sin. Think about that for a minute. If grace didn't abound even when we sinned, that question wouldn't make any sense. Okay? It wouldn't make any sense to ask, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, Paul's answer is no, we should not continue in sin that grace may abound. The implication, though, is that if we sin, we have grace. But, what Paul is saying is this, don't look at grace as a license to sin. That's not what grace is. It's not a license to sin. In other words, if I were to suddenly say, you know what, I've got grace I'm going to go out and just start living in sin. I'm going to go out and, and do all kinds of evil things. I'm going to go get drunk and commit adultery and, and murder some people because i got grace. Whoa, wait a minute now. No, 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 grace doesn't cover that. Because that's continuing in sin, okay? That's continuing in sin. All right? But if I'm trying to live the Christian life and, and I'm not going out there and doing all those things and I have an evil thought against somebody, is God's grace going to cover that? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. There, there's one point you ask if there's anything else. I think there is in John 4. All right, go ahead. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are from God or from evil. False prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God and every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That's right. It's on us. Yes. It's not on, that's the problem. It's right. not on believing what Brother Paul says. Or, you know, you've got to work your salvation out. You right. Say, that's what's going on too much today. Is people are not testing the Spirit. They don't, they don't question Yes, they just accept without thinking about what the Bible teaches. And, you know, that's one of the unique things, I believe, at least, you know, I say about the churches of Christ um, the way it used to be. Uh, I don't know if it's so much that way anymore in some places, but here I invite you to question me. I invite you to uh, say is what Kevin is saying true? Is that right? You know, please, please do that. I'm just a man. I can make mistakes. I have made mistakes before in teaching and preaching, and I regret it. But no one is above being questioned with the Word of God, all right? And, and you know, if anyone thinks they're above being questioned by the Word of God, that person has an attitude problem. That has a pride problem right there. No one is above being questioned by the Word of God. Even the Apostle Paul was not above being questioned by the Word of God. Remember in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, those at Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether the things that Paul taught, all right, were so. Paul said it. They said, let's see if the scriptures actually say what he said. And so they went back to look. They, oh, sure enough, they did. Okay, well, well then we're going to believe that. That's the right way to do things. And if, if people would do that, we wouldn't have so much false doctrine in the world today, but people don't do that. They just eat up the false doctrine left and right. They want their one hour a week. This is what they want. They want one hour to two hours a week, and then the rest of the week they got too much to do. They don't want to study. You know, we might not can, can question you right now, but if we were, if we're not studying on our own somewhere other than right here in this building, then you could tell us the sky is purple. If we don't ever look up, we don't know. 
But if you're not going to study other than one hour a week, then you're, like I said, you're going to follow whoever, whoever's the coolest guy standing in front of you. That's who you're going to listen to. And that's certainly not me, so, you know, I mean, you'd be going somewhere else. <laughs>
might sound a little harsh, but I mean, Jesus was harsh sometimes with people who made it clear that uh, they didn't want anything to do with what he was teaching or with him, and he let them go. He said, let them go. Uh, you know, the, the, the disciples came to Jesus one time and said, the Pharisees were offended with you. They were offended with you. And uh, Jesus said, let them go. If the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall into the ditch. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yes, do you have a question? Comment? Brother or Ray? Yeah, uh, I do. Uh, sometimes you get discouraged uh, when you're trying to uh, tell someone about God. Like when you still go and things like that. And though sometimes you just get rejected. Right? But then you go to a house and somebody just takes you in and the receptive to God's word. So we shouldn't just give up.